Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. And it's a huge honor to be um, a part of this amazing panel. And my sharing today will be a bit of a combination of continentalist methods and approaches towards data, but also a little of my own learning here as a master's student in the University of Edinburgh, um, taking co a course on data inequality in society. Um, I have a, quite a few um, slides and ideas to share, so please bear with me while I go through these relatively quickly and briefly. Um, so first, let me introduce a little about Continentalist. We are a data-driven publication and editorial studio with an explicit mission to center Asian voices and stories, countering Eurocentrism and Western bias. Um, our approach to this is grounded in data because we believe it to have a strong persuasive quality. It operates with believability and empiricism and has the ability to get people of differing or even opposing views onto the same page. Particularly, we love it for its myth-busting abilities um, and how we can take conversations out of the endototal realm to a more concrete footing. So we strive to be a bridge between the research sector and the public, and we use intentional information communication and design to ensure that the data is well communicated and accessible. But as we obviously know, data is not neutral. It is often gated and wielded by those with power uh, for their agendas. And there is a tendency for us to think of data as an idealized form of knowledge, that it is reliable, accurate, correct, and true. And in, even in our everyday language, we would often ask, do you have the data for that? As a way of fact-checking statements, justifying our arguments, and so on. And there is also an unspoken belief that, that it somehow deeply reflects reality, and in many ways it does, even in how it encodes societal bias, discrimination, and inequalities. So while Continentalist holds this view of data, we also recognize the importance of humanizing it. Um, here I have three concepts that I would like to add to today's conversation on how we can shift our understanding and use of data a little. Um, the first is from Johanna Drigger's paper on humanities approaches to graphical display, which introduces us to the concept of data as captor. And she suggests that data isn't items observed, but rather they are captured, actively taken and constructed. It is what she calls, quote, an interpretation of the phenomenal world and not inherent in it, unquote. So when thinking of data as captor, it also brings to mind the inherent power dynamics of data collection, asking the important questions of who is doing the collecting and what is being collected. Her argument of data as captor also helps us see how data can be extremely reductive, especially so when put into information visualization. So we see many responses of this, um, especially recently, in regards to the atrocities in Gaza, and that no matter how hard one tries to visualize the scale of death, it all seems to reduce something horrific into a single statistic or an image that makes lives, the loss of life more digestible for our comprehension. And the second is the concept of data bodies by Terry Lynn Thompson, which, help us draw us, which helps us draw an explicit and deliberate connection between the relationship between data and physical bodies, and she argues that thinking of these two things together can help us understand data and bodies as co-constituted lived practices that turns into becomings. Data bodies help us understand the inseparable and inseparable and symbiotic relationship that we've developed with data, especially big data, and how we wield it and the ways it influences us in return. And it draws a visceral relationship between what is quantified and its material impacts on human life. Lastly is um, Data Humanism. It's a manifesto developed by the famous artist and designer Georgia Lupi on how we should approach data, create data visualizations that viewers can relate to. Um, she stresses, much like Druka, that data is merely a snapshot of the world, the same way that we take a photograph on our cameras. They are simply placeholders and fleeting, and to operate and wield them as hard facts is forgetting that data is simply texture and does not show us the complexity of life in our world. And in her essay, she says, it's time to leave behind any presumptions of absolute control and universal truth and embrace an informed depiction of the big numbers and small imperfections that work together to describe reality. And data visualization should embrace imperfection and approximation, allowing us to envision ways to use data to feel more empathetic and connect with ourselves and others at a deeper level. Her paper or her manifesto is a clarion call to draw attention to the imperfections and uncertainties of data that seem to go against popular notions of data as being objective. And it is, we now see data as valuable as gold. Uh, we use it to formulate policies and justify decisions, yet we very not often question its integrity 
And from it, we generate thousands of charts and graphs without further questioning of what this does to our cognitive understanding of humanity and life. So her manifesto really pushes us to think, how can we make data more visceral for our audiences and make it more connected to the individual human life? So Continentalist is still exploring and uh, developing our own methodologies and approaches to this um, and the issues that plague data and its challenges. But here are some of the things that we've applied and it's not comprehensive or exhaustive, um, but it's a general ethos that we apply to our work. Here's a rundown of the five things. Um, center stories, apply healthy skepticism to the data, expand what we think constitutes data, think intersectionality and leverage community. So in the first, centering stories. Obviously, we always stress the importance of humanizing data with stories and empathy, which is why our publications uses multimedia visual storytelling as our default approach to bring our readers through the ins and outs of a data investigation. And we supplement our work with a lot of qualitative information, adding audio clips, voices, images, and illustrations to ensure stories remain ultimately about people. We also try to adopt a healthy skepticism of data and we always ask our classic who, what, when, and how questions, and even why, when we look at data sets. Who is producing the data, and do they have business doing so? Does the data tally with our understanding of reality, or does it raise suspicion? What is said or not said in these data sets? Who is represented and who isn't? And is this a story or topic where data should even be a part of the conversation to begin with? We also encourage an expansion of what constitutes data and what is also considered recredible and reliable. Um, as we're probably familiar, myth and mysticism are not simply beliefs in much of Asia, but also understood as realities. And we've worked with cultural groups to datafy some of these, such as exploring the distribution of ghostly confessions on the spatial map. So we reject the notion that things must be necessarily empirical for conversations to start, and instead focus on the representation and availability of data sets. In one story, for example, we used Raman Rater's list of, uh, you know, data of like instant noodles around the world to ground our understanding of the shared love of instant noodles across Asian cultures. To think intersectionality also ensures that we apply a feminist and humanist uh, centered approach to our work. So in a recent story that we did um, discussing women's leisure and rest, we understand that women have varied experiences depending on the city, families, income level and the background that they're in. And instead of simply sending out a blanket survey, we made a culture-centered approach to understanding this question and collaborated with 12 different organizations to conduct interviews across several cities within Asia, talking to women across a wide spectrum of incomes and understand their shared and differentiated experiences. Um, we looked at income, as I mentioned, and multiple factors, but also, such as distance, transport options, and spaces to have a full picture for what's required for leisure. And lastly is to leverage community, which is something that we did with my grand deathbed team as well. But we reject the notion that in order to make meaningful commentary, data has to be somehow collected comprehensively or in accordance with statistical rules and guidance. This is often limiting and it raises the barrier to entry for those who have less resources to engage in conversations. And we also believe in the power of data activism and counter data, as we have seen with the Micro Death Map project. But also leveraging the power of community, we can take that power back from structures and institutions and make our own meaning of what's available, as we did in these stories about climate change that we crawled, uh, that we combed um, the parliament website for, uh, for PQs, and also on the right that we combed through with uh, Women Unbound uh, for newspaper articles on sexual violence in Singapore. I thought I would be useful to end this sharing with some questions that we in the continent's list team have been pondering for a while and have set as challenges for ourselves on the road ahead, which is how do we represent data that our scales have no language or numbers for? How do we represent data with empathy, showing uncertainty and imperfection? And how do we make data visceral uh, for audiences? So I wanted to ask the panel whether there have been times in your research where you've had to reframe the context of the data or to paraphrase what Arifin said yesterday, you just put up the data, let it tell the story itself, get people to come to their own conclusions uh, in order to let that story that you're trying to tell be more approachable. And I'll leave that last word open-ended, whether it's approachable to the government or the wider public. Yeah. Thank you um, for that question. I think that really um, speaks to what Continentalist does a lot. Um, I will use the HDB. Um, last week, I gave a little talk um, to an, you know, a, a group of um, 
a journalist or for, for as part of a talk from NUS Press about um, HDB data particularly. And also interestingly, there's a very enthusiastic person called Tioalida.com who collects um, HDB data for fun and puts it up all on, on, on his website, which you can purchase for a very small fee and use. Um, so, you know, there are people doing a lot of work out there. Um, I think when you think about, you know, HDB data, for example, and what's publicly available in terms of just looking at the resale data set, which is the most granular data set available on the topic of anything concerning HDB. Um, it has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of rows um, and it records every flat sold, you know, since the 1990s up to now. That data set can tell us so many stories. So to presume that data sort of speaks for itself is really false. You will need to, you know, process it in some shape or form. And it really matters on who is asking the questions and who's doing the framing. Um, and in Continentalis, you know, we look at that data set and we ask questions about accessibility um, and also affordability, right? And somebody who is, you know, a housing agent or a property agent will be looking at it with a very, very different question or if you're like, you know, 99.co or property guru, you'll be looking at it of like, you know, when does prices peak and when is the best time to sell your flat and so on and so forth. So I think the levels, I mean, it really varies. So, you know, data doesn't speak for itself. Um, you need to frame it, but also data communication is really important. And that's what we really strive towards in making it easy, not just easy to understand and accessible to understand, but making sure you drive the point home and you do not lose the humane in the communication of the data. So that's one of the things that many people struggled with during COVID, right? So you have, you know, a huge scale loss of death, uh, loss of lives, and you just, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people dying every day. And how do you represent that in a way that's humane and still connect people to, to that fact that there are people dying? And that's also very much what the Migrant Death Met track, um, team tried to do in connecting, you know, the, the relationship between the material land with the death that occurs on it. Um, so, so that is just my thoughts to that question particularly. Um, maybe I can share a little about this because this is um, something that Constantless also thinks a lot about. And we have now developed a common practice um, underscoring all of our pieces of work. Um, and it's something that we started also um, at the very beginning um, in, a, in some shape or form. So the first thing we, we realized in this is well, to, to stand up to scrutiny, you need to allow people to scrutinize. Um, and to allow them to scrutinize, you need to provide them the resources and the tools to do so. Um, so very early on, even though we didn't really necessarily apply, um, uh, you know, a rigor around our data, we will publish a full list of uh, references in which we draw from to that informs our article and making sure that every single data that we use um, on our page, you can trace it back to the very um, beginning or the original source. Um, that was used. I think, and, th and this is something a lot of uh, publications are guilty of, especially newspapers. They, you know, interest of time, whatever, they just kind of put a little, you know, one one word thing like World Bank or, you know, Singapore Stat. They don't tell you exactly where or when they got it. And that is really important for data collection because, you know, as we know, the government websites are changing all the time. One day it's up there and then tomorrow it's not. So, you know, it's very important to be able to trace um, the source of the data um, from when it's come from. And answering also Aaron's question about volunteer-led um, initiatives and how you sort of mitigate some of these challenges uh, being, you know, uh, like applying a more rigorous sort of standard when the skill sets are so varied and how do you navigate between qualitative and quantitative. So in Conti, all of our stories now, at the most of our pieces at the end, we will have a very long methodology note. Um, and I think we, in a collaboration that we did with John, <laughs> we struggle with John a lot because I sent them such a long methodology note and then so they was like, can shorten, <laughs> um, can shorten some more important to say all of this. And it's incredibly important to say all of this, especially when you're commenting on something sensitive. And obviously the more sensitive the topic, the longer the methodology note's gotta be because we need to explain um, every single step that we've taken, every consideration that we've had. This is something we also discussed with the Migrant Death Met team when we worked with them and also in our story on sexual violence in Singapore. And that one was particularly tricky because we really needed to walk people through, uh, uh, you know, how the data was collected, but also in then exploring the data set, we need to explain to them why we've decided to take, you know, to, to focus on a particular category uh, of the data set as opposed to, you know, everything all at once. So that you know, trust, being open and transparent, allowing, you know, providing the data to 
the people reading your work or examining your work uh, to scrutinize and formulate their own um, responses to that data set and challenge your findings is really important. We have had in our experience, our lovely readers have gone through our websites and go like, hey, you know, this seems to be a little off or this number doesn't seem accurate. And they are also our fact checkers, right? They make sure that we are really um, accurate and, you know, and that also enables us to be protected um, in a sense, yeah.